We are coming on the air with the divide over a potential pause in the Israel-Hamas war, with Israel pushing back, saying that's not going to happen until all hostages are released. As the fighting intensifies now, more people in Gaza losing their homes, and new controversy over the possible targeting of an ambulance. We are live on the ground. Then a scary moment in the air after a passenger's backpack explodes. Look at that. That's them putting out the fire with water. We're going to explain. And this year already looks like it's going to be the warmest one we've ever had. But guess what? Winter is coming anyway. Brand new maps showing where the snow is set to hit soon. Plus, in tonight's backstory, we go behind the scenes with our reporter who has covered every second of the saga of SPF, who's now a convicted felon. What's been most surprising about the fall of the crypto king and what it's really been like covering his rise and now... Fall. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight, divided messages now coming out of the Middle East over a temporary pause in fighting. Even as you take a look here at what the Gaza skyline is looking like tonight, flares and missiles we saw lighting up the sky. It's happening at a critical time in this war between Israel and Hamas, with Israel's military surrounding Gaza City now after the Hamas terror attack nearly a month ago. The Israelis responding in just the last few hours to accusations from Hamas that the military targeted ambulances like this one and hospitals in Gaza. Israeli forces say one of their airstrikes did hit an ambulance that they say was being used by Hamas. NBC News has not been able to verify these claims. Today, the first group of American citizens arriving at the U.S. Embassy in Cairo after crossing through that Rafah border crossing between Gaza and Egypt. What are you looking at here? This is a picture that the embassy has released of one woman and kids who arrived today. This is after more than 100 Americans and their families have left Gaza, according to the White House. We know that has been one of the big priorities for the Biden administration, getting Americans to safety. But it's also about freeing hostages and getting more humanitarian help to innocent people inside Gaza. Here's Secretary of State Tony Blinken, who's visiting today. We've been clear that as Israel conducts this campaign to defeat Hamas, how it does so matters. It matters because it's the right and lawful thing to do. It matters because failure to do so plays into the hands of Hamas and other terror groups. Blinken pushing for a temporary pause in fighting, but the Israeli prime minister says that is not going to happen until hostages abducted by Hamas terrorists almost a month ago are freed. And now how Israel is carrying out this war seems to be becoming a growing concern for some officials inside the Biden administration who are not sure now if Israel can be reined in, according to current and former senior U.S. officials. It comes as the leader of the Iran-backed militant group Hezbollah warns that a wider conflict in the Middle East is now a realistic possibility, in his words. We're going to talk more about that with Matt Bradley in just a second. He is in Lebanon, but I want to start with Ellison Barber near the Israel-Gaza border tonight. Ellison, I see you looking over your shoulder. Tell us what it's like on the ground. Mm-hmm. Hey, Hallie. Yeah, we've just heard a massive amount of explosions and flashes of orange in this section of the Gaza border. It has been not quite as active as what we'd seen in earlier hours of the day and certainly in what we were seeing around the time we were talking to you yesterday. But then the series of booms that we have heard just in the last 10 minutes or so, it has been an incredibly deep, consistent, and sort of like a rapid fire uh, of heavy caliber artillery. You might be able to hear some of the pops now. You also can probably hear there's a military helicopter overhead of us right now. Israel has been very clear in saying that they are continuing to expand their operations on the ground. You mentioned, and we talked about this on air yesterday, uh, the IDF, they say they have completed the encirclement of Gaza City and plan to continue their efforts and activity in that area. Two things we saw happen today that are raising a lot of questions are those strikes on ambulances. There are two different incidents we're talking about there. Uh, one where a ambulance was reportedly struck kind of at the gates of Al-Shifa Hospital. And that incident, according to Gaza's Ministry of Health, at least 17 people were killed. And then there was another incident, another strike on what's been described as a convoy of ambulances, according to the Palestinian Red Crescent. They say And if you keep looking back here, you might see a little more activity happening. But they say that one of their ambulances was traveling with that convoy when it was struck. Uh, They are claiming that this was a convoy that was taking people who were injured towards the Rafa border crossing so they could possibly be evacuated. The IDF is saying that they targeted those ambulances because they claim they were being used by Hamas terrorists and that Hamas terrorists use ambulances, they say, to operate and move weapons around Gaza. Uh, we have not been able to independently verify 
any of that information coming from the IDF. Uh, they claim they will release more evidence. One thing I can tell you, Hallie, is before that convoy of ambulances left the hospital to make its way towards Rafa Crossing. The director with Gaza's Ministry of Health held a press conference and spoke with reporters. Our NBC News team in Gaza was there. And in that press conference, he talked about this convoy of ambulances leaving mm. and publicized the exact route they were planning to take. Hallie. Uh, Ellison, let me ask you this, because as we're, as we're keeping an eye on, obviously, the activity where you are, um, we know that the Israeli military, based on what we've heard and seen from officials, has encircled Gaza City. Any sense of timing here on when they may move in? We know that the Israeli prime minister has been very clear that a ceasefire is not for them an option on the table right now, even despite some international presser, pressure for that so-called temporary pause. I mean, it seems like we're talking really about any minute and a matter of hours. I mean, they're moving quickly. Last night after there were the reports that they'd encircled Gaza City, the Institute for the Study of War, a nonprofit think tank in D.C., they were saying that based on some of their observations, their satellite imagery, that Israeli forces had at that point also made it all the way to the coast with the Mediterranean Sea. So they do seem to be moving incredibly quickly. Hamas says that they are encountering resistance and both sides have described violent clashes between forces on the ground in northern Gaza as they make their way closer to Gaza City. Hallie. Ellison Barber, live for us there along the Israel-Gaza border. Ellison, thank you so much. Matt Bradley, I want to turn now to you in Lebanon because almost from the, um, from the first day or two that this war began, the question had been, could this escalate into some kind of a broader regional conflict given obviously the northern border of Israel, the border with Lebanon there. We are now hearing from Hezbollah's leader today. We've talked with you a lot about Hezbollah, this militant group. Um, Talk through about what we're hearing, because it was not a declaration necessarily of war now on a second front. We didn't hear him go that far, but obviously still a concern for the Israelis that the potential um, of that happening could be problematic. Yeah, I mean, he didn't really say he was going to declare war. He didn't back down. In fact, he actually used the word, sort of an Arabic phrase, and I'm holding the stick from the middle, and I think we have the same phrase in English. Essentially, he's trying to have it both ways, leaving all of the options open. He said that Hezbollah wouldn't, paraphrasing here, wouldn't be confined to the options that are already on the table, and that he could essentially do anything. And they're based on two things, whether or not Lebanon or Hezbollah gets attacked. And this was kind of a veiled, not so veiled threat uh, to the United States because he knows and he made constant references throughout this hour and a half long speech to the fact that the United States had deployed forces, extra forces in the region, including those warships, including those two aircraft carrier strike groups off the coast in the Mediterranean. That sounded like a major provocation to Mr. Nasrallah and all of his supporters who we were amongst. The other thing is what Israel does in the Gaza Strip, and we've known this from the beginning, or at least we've heard this from people close to Hezbollah, that Hezbollah is going to be waiting to see just how hard Israel brings the hammer down on the Gaza Strip. But the question is, what is he waiting for? There's already been some real punishment by the Israelis against the Gazans. You mentioned the big rallies, the crowds coming together in Beirut to watch this speech now from the Hezbollah leader. I know you referenced being there. What do you make of the timing here, the first time that we're hearing from him since this war began? Yeah, I mean, that was the big question, right? I mean, nobody really knows. You could almost say that the, the real news that came out of this wasn't what he said, but the fact that he spoke at all. Yeah. Because Hassan Nasrallah is a voluble man. He speaks on anything. He'll talk on any topic for hours and hours. Uh, but he hasn't spoken for the last four weeks. So that was really surprising to a lot of people because they watched as every leader and luminary, president and king, Everybody in the whole Middle East had something to say about what was going on in Israel and the Gaza Strip, except the man who always has something to say. So it was unclear exactly what that meant. And actually, there was kind of some sort of some talk amongst our group here, our team and some others. Was he really keeping everybody waiting that long just to say that? Mm. It's kind of hard to tell. I mean, he had a lot to say for sure, but he kept the entire region on tenterhooks for a very long time. I can't come up with any conclusions about it, Hallie. Matt Bradley, live for us there in Lebanon. Matt, we're glad to have you there. Thank you very much for your reporting for us on the ground. We talked about how one of the priorities for the Biden administration is getting Americans out of Gaza. I want to bring in, in now Emily Rauschenberger, who just crossed the border into Egypt with her family yesterday. She was born and raised in Illinois. Emily, you live in, in the U.K. now. I know, first of all, thank you so much for being with us. How are you doing? Where, where are you? 
Um, we're uh, in the Intercontinental Hotel in Cairo, um, brought here by the uh, American consulate once we pass through the Egyptian uh, Palestinian border. Um, of course, we're doing much better. We have running water and food and and uh, um, all essentials. So we're, um, we're infinitely better than 24 hours prior. I have to ask, I mean, you had been visiting Gaza with your husband, with your kids. Did you ever think you would end up stuck for weeks in this just horrific situation? What was the process like getting out? Um, no, this is beyond any imagination uh, of a situation we thought we could be in. Um, the process of getting out was torturous. You know, we thought in the early days, and whenever we went to visit family uh, in Gaza, you know, we, we thought, you know, if anything happened, you know, usually foreign nationals are allowed out before really uh, intensive uh, military campaigns are, are, are waged. So it, it was, came as a shock what happened on October 7th. And, and by October 9th, we had to leave our homes uh, by order of Israel because they were bombing the area uh, intensively from that night on. And so um, getting out, you know, we tried the first two times that the uh, American embassy said it might possibly open in the, during those first few, few days. Um, but again, it never did open. And as you probably reported, it was bombed by Israel. So we were um, we were stuck, really. And uh, we had ultimately sought refuge in an apartment building outside of Khan Yunus in the south uh, and it just waited for news. And it, it just seemed like forever. Um, but on um, on Wednesday and Thursday, you know, we heard of the border opening and we're on the list uh, yesterday me and my children uh, as American citizens. We are dual British nationals now with my husband, a uh, British uh, citizen, but he was not on the list. So it was, we were prepared to to go and leave him and hope that he would come in, in other days. But um, thankfully we were able after a whole day of, of waiting and struggle to, to pass the border with him with us. So that was a relief, but also a heartbreak because we left behind the whole the whole family we'd been visiting and all the friends and loved ones in Gaza that are struggling so much. What are the conditions like for them? What were they like when you were there in that apartment building, you said? And, then, and just so people know, that was the southern part of the Gaza Strip where you were staying, closer, obviously, to where that border crossing was. I understand that you and your family showed up, I want to say, three or four times, thinking that perhaps that was going to be the day where you could get out. It wasn't, obviously, until this week that that happened. But can you, can you tell us more about the conditions that you were in, that your family was in? Uh, again, very horrendous. Um, we were in, uh, we found an apartment that we could stay in with, with the whole extended family. So we had about 30 people in the apartment um, from an 80, my 80 year old mother-in-law to uh, a two year old baby. Um, you know, we we kind of just banded together and some people in the morning at dawn when, when some of the bombing subsided, subsided would go, you know, go and get in the bread lines, whether in the area or in more into the city in Khan Yunus, because it was very hard to find bread. Other people went to to find water, like the next water source to fill up jugs. Um, others looked after the kids uh, and, and still others we sent to to try to find a solar um, a source of solar energy to charge our devices to keep informed. But, you know, at the end, you had just having just increasing bombardment and the, the psychological stress and the physical conditions. Everyone is struggling. It's it's like the Walking Dead, really, because as you just struggling to um, to find the necessities. What is your message to the Biden administration now, Emily? Um, I know that, of course, Secretary of State, as we talked about a minute ago, is in, is in the region, Tony Blinken. There had been this push. I know the embassy workers had, had worked with you, I believe, and, and other Americans to get you out. What do you want them to know? Um, that a ceasefire is, is needs, needs to happen. There needs to be greater pressure because nobody is going to benefit from the destruction of, of the Gaza Strip and all the 2.3 million people there, most of which who are just trying to survive in their situation. Um, you know, we, again, we see our family there that have lived there generations and generations. You know, most people in the Gaza Strip, 70 percent are, are refugees from 1948 that you know had to make gaza their home after israel was created and but my my in-laws are people originally from gaza and, and this is you know this has been um you know a, a very huge struggle in the past 20 years just to to find a job to find sustenance to find an education for your family and and so you know the bombardment and the killing of of so many innocent civilians um who have no place else to go is is a humanitarian disaster that we 
that does not accomplish any any of the goals Israel or Americans or or Palestinians want to see. And I I just I just need to emphasize like there needs to be a better way to to go through this conflict and find uh, answers for for both sides. Emily Rauschenberger, thank you so much for your time tonight. I know it's been uh, obviously a harrowing few weeks for you. We are glad that you and your family are safe and headed back home. Thank you. Thank you we very talked much. About President Biden and the Biden administration, what they're doing as it relates to this international crisis. It comes against the backdrop of President Biden himself here in the United States heading to Maine, reiterating his call for new gun laws after visiting with first responders from last week's mass shooting there. This is about common sense, reasonable, responsible measures to protect our children, our families, our communities. The president and first lady, as we speak, are meeting with families and victims of that horrific attack at a bar and bowling alley in Lewiston. 18 people died there, making it the deadliest mass shooting in this country this year. I want to bring in George Solis, who is live for us in Maine. Nine days since this shooting happened, George, the, we have seen the president do this before, travel to places that have gone through unimaginable grief that have been the site of, um, of violence and try to act as a consoler in chief in some ways. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. That is the sentiment here. And the president speaking, one of the remarks that struck me, as he mentioned, he mentioned Uvalde. He mentioned Monterey Park. He said, uh, too many to count from places that never make news across America. Well, Maine, Lewiston did make news, and many in this community not happy that it did for the reasons that it did. This community, as you know, was paralyzed, unable to share their grief as that manhunt ensued. Then news came down that the shooter was found dead and these people came together in a very big way. We saw vigils, we saw monuments, even one here behind me at the bowling alley. Pumpkins etched out with messages to the victims, to the survivors, and that's something the president also addressed during his speech, that those people that survived this mass shooting have those scars, but he called on the community to come together. The resiliency of people as he's seen time and time again through these shootings. But the reality is the normalcy here is not it's going to take some time. I mean, earlier I spoke with a teenager who was paying their respects. They're from nearby Brunswick. They came by, sobbed, mourned a little bit. Then she told me a story about how their school went through an active shooter drill, which is something that was only ever discussed. Today, they put that into practice. And for them, that is now the new norm. And it is just harrowing to them. It is unfathomable to them that this happened in their community. But they're grateful for so much support that they have seen, not only from their local community, but from across the world and, frankly, the globe. Take a listen to what she told me earlier today, Hallie. Thinking about it and thinking about it happening to you at school or anywhere is um, not normal. And I think just feeling normal during this kind of thing would be kind of weird because it's not something that should be normal. Um, it's not something we should ever have to practice or get used to. Yeah, it's so hard to really fathom what these people are, are going through in this time. President and the First Lady also stopping by Schmengi's, the bar and grill, where this perpetrator carried out part of this attack, laying flowers, laying a wreath there, meeting with those first responders, those nurses, people that really made the difference in those early hours as this uh, shooting investigation transpired. Many of the funerals are also set to start taking place this weekend. Again, for many in this community, uh, time heals all wounds, but obviously the scars that are felt and, and are here now uh, are, are certainly going to be felt for some time, Hallie. George Solis, thank you very much. Live for us there from Lewiston, Maine. We're glad to have you there. Let's take you to New York now, where the gag order that former President Trump is under is now getting expanded to include Mr. Trump's attorneys. That's because the judge in this civil tax fraud case is not at all pleased with the shots his staff is taking, specifically his law clerk, with some back and forth in court over that today. And that was taking some of the attention away from what you're seeing here, Eric Trump's testimony in a case where prosecutors accuse Mr. Trump of lying about how much his business is worth. After court, Eric, taking a page out of his father's playbook, calling the whole thing a political witch hunt. They dragged on and on and you walk into it as a black image. They only want our names in this thing because it sensationalizes the case. We've done absolutely nothing wrong. We have a better company than they could have ever imagined. 
Come Monday, next in line, the former president himself on the stand testifying under oath. I want to bring in Lindsay Reiser, who's covering everything for us on this one. So, Lindsay, new gag order now after a bunch of drama in court. Why is it that the law clerk has become such a central figure here? Well, Chris Kais, Trump's attorney, continues to imply in the courtroom that his clerk is biased and politically leaning to the left. And the judge is furious over this. He's already issued a partial limited gag order preventing all parties from making public comments about members of his staff or posting about them. And now it has expanded. Essentially, the judge saying, and I want to go ahead and read, uh, let me just pull this up, all counsel are prohibited from making any public statements in or out of court that refer to any confidential communications in any form between my staff and me. And Hallie, this has to do with something that happened we talked about yesterday before court adjourned and there was some no passing between the clerk and the judge. The judge says that he has an unfettered right to talk to members of his staff in his gag order. He cited the New York rule that allows this to happen and says, in fact, it is the principal, it is the primary role of the principal law clerk to help a judge adjudicate their responsibilities. And so he went on in this gag order, Hallie, to say, since the commencement of this bench trial, my chambers have been inundated with hundreds of harassing and threatening phone calls, voicemails, emails, letters, and packages. No comment yet from Trump's attorneys, Hallie. What about um, the ex expectation for testimony from Mr. Trump himself next week, then Ivanka Trump on the stand? Do we expect that it's going to reflect some of what we heard from Eric Trump, for example, as he was pressed about some of these financial statements and his involvement with, like, the, you know, the, the money piece of the business? Yeah, and, and there was a definite stylistic difference between the testimony we heard today and that of Don Jr. Don Jr. seemed very relaxed, at times was joking with the judge. Eric Trump seemed much more nervous, according to our producer in the courtroom, and look, often scanned the courtroom looking to the defense table as well. And things got heated sometimes during the questioning. Remember, these are the state's witnesses, so this direct examination is with the Office of the Attorney General. And, and at one point, Eric today said, well, of course I know there are financial statements. This is a huge organization. The Attorney General's office trying to drill down on those documents that they say contain overvalued assets that help them get better terms. And so on Monday, you mentioned the former president will be here to testify. We saw Secret Service today getting a lay of the land, and we can certainly expect uh, more fireworks in the courtroom on Monday. Um, and we can also potentially expect him to say similar things to what Don Jr. Eric did, and that is he relied on other people, the accountants, former CFO Alan Weisselberg, uh, to, to essentially help them with the appraisals that they weren't focused on things that were that granular. You mentioned Ivanka scheduled for testimony on Wednesday. She had appealed the subpoena to testify. The appellate division denied that, and so it looks like we will see her on Wednesday. And Hallie, we don't exactly have the greatest idea of what she's going to talk about because she hasn't been deposed yet. We have video right. deposition of the other Trump family members, but we have not heard yet. We can expect the attorney general's office, though, to ask her questions. They say she has intimate knowledge of the business dealings, Hallie. Lindsay Reiser, live for us there in New York. I'm sure we will talk again next week, Linz. Thank you. So listen, job creation slowed down a little bit in October, which could take some of the heat off the Fed and its fight against inflation. Why did things get slower? Well, apparently, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, auto worker strikes, the manufacturing industry, down 35,000 jobs. So here's the question you probably care about. OK, Hallie, so what does this mean about the state of the economy? OK, Brian Chung, who's joining us now, what does this mean about the state of our economy? Yeah, well, what it tells us is that we're still adding jobs, so we're not in a recession, but it's slowing down a little bit. So here's a little bit more context on that 150,000 jobs number, which we got this morning. Again, that's how many were added in the month of October. That's a slower pace than the 297,000 jobs we saw added in the month of September. And interestingly, the unemployment rate did tick up to 3.9%, up from 3.8% in the prior month. You don't want to read too much into a 0.1 percentage point in uh, increase, but still worth watching in the months to come. Now, where do we see the job gains, leisure and hospitality? So that's bars and restaurants. Check out healthcare, adding over 58,000 jobs in the month. And as you mentioned, Hallie, motor vehicle and parts manufacturing did contract by 33,000 because of the UAW strike, which we know was resolved last week. So that number could reverse in the next month to come. But of course, we're also watching not just whether or not people have jobs, but how much they're getting paid in those jobs. So again, when you look at October of this year to October of last year, wages grew by 4.1%. That's a slower pace than the 4.2%. But to your point about the Federal Reserve, what they're looking at is, well, this is outpacing inflation of 3.7%. So the wallet kind of growing a little bit faster than the price tags at the store. But nonetheless, certainly worth noting that the job gains are slowing. Whether or not that trend continues is something we'll have to pay attention to.
We've, been, we've got the Fed trying to lower inflation. I mean, I think people know Jay Powell said this week, we talked about it here on the show, the Fed chair said we are not likely to receive a recession. You've talked about how these numbers fit into all this, Brian, but is there anything that's surprising you out of this? Is there anything that you think is like getting lost, I think, in the bigger picture, quote unquote, narrative around the jobs numbers? Yeah, well, I mean, it's not just Jay Powell, by the way. He was saying that the other members of the Federal Reserve, he's not the only one that votes on policy, were saying they don't forecast the recession happening. Now, that's really good news, but we have to remember that the Federal Reserve is looking at these, these data points and saying, how do we know that the mission, which is right in front of us, of trying to lower inflation, this 3.7%, they still want that to go down to 2%. Right. So what they're looking at here is not necessarily the jobs numbers, it's the inflation report. So I don't really want to say that what I talked about for the past few minutes isn't important, but what really looking at <laughs> is the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, which, of course, that report will come out in a week and a half. And, Howie, I'm sure I'll be standing probably right here to talk about Book that it. then. Okay. Book it, dude. Yeah, get I, ready. I Just get I it will. on the calendar. Thank you. Brian Chung, appreciate it. Thanks for making sense of it. Coming up here on the show. We're taking you out to Utah, where the mother accused of killing her husband and writing a children's book about grief is appearing in court today. What her defense in this very high-profile case could look like. Plus, what officials in Kentucky are saying about the search for that worker missing in a coal plant collapse. That's in the five things coming up. The author accused of poisoning and killing her husband with fentanyl is back in court today, literally as we speak. The judge, you're taking a live look, in fact, of the courtroom right now. The judge is looking to set a calendar for this case after Corey Richardson's lawyer asked for more time to get familiar with some of the evidence here. Like, for example, changes in the couple's life insurance policy right before Eric Richardson's death. They want to look at Corey Richardson's alleged Internet searches. Things like, what is a lethal dose of fentanyl? With her brother and mother defending her during an ABC News interview this morning. Watch. I do not believe in my heart Corey could ever not just kill Eric, but kill anything or anyone. She loves her, her boys way too much to, to take their father away from them. Remember, Richens, before this, was best known for her children's book focused on grief, which she wrote after her husband who she's accused of murdering, died. She denies all the accusations against her. She says she's innocent. Danny Savalos is joining us now. So, Danny, there's um, a lot of discussion in this case, and specifically today, about the idea, about the situation of what's called a walk the dog letter. W what does that mean? What's that about? It's not a criminal procedure thing. It is a title that was placed on the top of a letter that the prosecution alleges was really a directive or an instruction manual that the defendant gave to family members telling them to testify falsely. Now, the defense has said, there it is right there, walk the dog at the top. The defense has said, on the other hand, look, this is just a novel that she was penning while in prison. And the defense has fired back saying, essentially, look, there was a gag order in this case. So when the prosecution took this letter and stuck it on the public filing system, it was the prosecution that violated the gag order by putting this out into the ether. So each side firing at each other side. The only the only part that I have to say I find mildly confusing is I understand the prosecution being concerned about witness tampering, but I would hardly, if I were the prosecutors, want her to stop talking to her family at all. Look at all the evidence it generates when she is allowed free communication with people from prison or jail. Any insight into the potential motive here? The prosecution has a ton of evidence on motive, and I expect that to be the defense's defense, is that to concede, look, there's a lot of evidence of things like insurance policies taken out on the victim. Uh, the defendant arguably had a lot to gain financially by the victim's death, and she had a lot of debt. The prosecution appears to have plenty of evidence of that. Uh, that is uh, not the same as having evidence of actually spiking the husband's drink with fentanyl. They do have evidence of that as well. But when it comes to motive, this is one of those cases where the prosecution is heavy on motive evidence, and they're going to rely on that a lot. Well, the medical examiner said that Eric, the husband here, had five times the lethal dosage of fentanyl in his system when he died. And according to evidence from the county sheriff's office, Richens said Eric had suspected that his wife had tried to poison him before. He'd actually warned his family about this. What is a defense strategy here that could be effective in front of a jury? 
Well, this is one of those cases where the prosecution has shut off increasingly more and more avenues for the defense. So really, the defense has only a few options, and one of those is going to be, sure, there may be evidence that there was fentanyl in his system, and maybe Eric was worried about his wife poisoning him, but there's no evidence that it uh, was the defendant who actually poisoned the victim. Uh, if there are many other possibilities, including that the defendant poisoned himself. Therefore, reasonable doubt exists. I'm just riffing here, but that really is one of just a few options that the defense has here. Danny Savalos, we're going to see how this one unfolds. Thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the second worker trapped inside that collapsed coal plant in Kentucky has been found dead, according to the state's governor. Remember, one other person died in the collapse. Why the collapse happened, still under investigation. Number two, a former Trump political appointee getting sentenced to nearly six years in prison today for assaulting police officers during the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. The judge in this case calling his behavior shocking and egregious, suggesting he would have had an even tougher sentence had he not already been on home detention for two years. Number three, police are investigating after a driver crashed through the gates of a nuclear power plant in South Carolina. It happened about an hour, apparently, after he was first asked to leave. Officials say he tried to hit some security guards. Fortunately, nobody was hurt and the plant is operating smoothly. Police are still looking for the driver. Number four, Jeff Bezos has taken his talents to Miami. He's lived in Seattle for decades, remember, ever since he started Amazon in his garage in the 90s. But in a new post, he says the move's going to bring him closer to his family and to his space company, Blue Origin. Number five, thousands of people are marching across the finish line now at the opening ceremony of this year's New York City Marathon. About 50,000 runners from all over the world are expected to compete on Sunday, big day. They're hoping the weather is looking good. When we come back, a California man says otters attacked him while he was swimming in a lake. Why, he says he felt like they wanted to kill him later in the local. Pretty scary moment on a jet blue plane when this portable charger, this backpack basically explodes on board. Look at this, people pouring water on this guy's stuff right after it caught fire. You had flight attendants, even some passengers jumping in to try to contain the flames as people try to get off the plane. Pretty chaotic evacuation there, although I guess any evacuation might be. Fortunately, and if you're like, how can people get off? The flight was still at the gate. They were getting ready for takeoff. The passenger apparently says he didn't know what kind of battery he had, but a lot of portable chargers use lithium ion batteries. They're used in stuff, a lot of things. Vape pens, cell phones, tablets, laptops, even electric toothbrushes, as you see right there. Tom Costello is joining us now. So these batteries are super common. Yep. This, this is a scary situation, right? Two things are true. So what do you do? How do you mitigate the, the risk of this? Well, this has been an ongoing problem with uh, these things catching fire on planes. And we just checked the FDA, FDA the FAA numbers here. They're rather concerning here. Uh, 491 cases since 2006. Just this year, year to date, through early October, 60. What does that mean? It means almost two a week yeah. of these instances, not always fires, smoke, overheating, whatever, 60 already this year. What does that mean for us? Well, the concern is, of course, if these things catch fire in flight, that could be a real, real problem. And that is why the FAA requires airlines to tell you when you go to your to check in with your flight, you're not checking any batteries, are you, right? The last time you checked a bag, remember, they say that to you, don't check it any batteries. It comes up on when you go to check in for your boarding pass. Correct. It says you have lithium-ion batteries, whatever you're checking. You can carry it on board in your carry-ons, but don't check it underneath because if you have a fire in the cargo hold, we could have a serious problem because that's beneath your feet, right? Now, yes, there are smoke detectors and there are fire detectors and there's halon that will be dispersed if there's a fire in the cargo hold. Nobody wants to take a chance like that. What are people supposed to do considering this is everywhere? Like, in other words, would it go so far as to ban? Like, is it even possible to ban lithium-ion batteries so. from a plane? But think about the numbers here. You know, we all carry, most have more than I one. I have an electric toothbrush. I got about three yeah. that, uh, of, of these devices I'm, that I carry with me on board a plane, right? So multiply that times 200 people, 600 of these items are on board a flight, on any given flight. Yeah. So you could imagine the potential risk here. What does that mean? If your battery is showing any signs of, of degradation, if there's chipping, if it looks like it's overheating regularly, if there's anything that doesn't look right, get it replaced and specifically don't bring it on board a plane in that kind of a condition.
Planes also have these special bags, containment bags that they can throw your device in. God forbid you have a fire. But let's not get to that point. It was just so interesting to see, I think, people jumping into action in that video from right. JetBlue, which we can show again here, the, right? The dumping the water on the thing and everything else. I mean, it... They were at the gate, scary which is a moment. good thing, but definitely a scary moment. Yeah, and literally, they all describe this as an explosion. We didn't catch the explosion on video, but uh, very concerning. People jumping off and a lot of commotion. And the guy whose bag it is, uh, his name is Jimmy Levy. He said he had just put his head back, leaned against the window, waiting for people to board, started to nod off, and suddenly his bag exploded. Wow. So that'll wake you up. Pretty He's not in trouble, is he? No, no, yeah. he did nothing wrong. Yeah. Uh, it it would have been a problem if we were in the cargo hold, though. Absolutely. Tom Costello, thank you for breaking that down for us. What, what wild times we live in. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Western Bureau, a man in California says he's feeling lucky to be alive after being attacked by two otters in a lake. He had something like 40 punctures. He was bitten in 12 spots. Officials say there was a separate otter attack at the same lake in July. They're now trying to figure out how to handle this. Out of our Southern Bureau, take a look at this. A deer busting right through a window of a restaurant in Virginia. Look at the moment this happened. Here comes the deer and everyone's like, what in the what? It runs through. It all went down pretty quick, 30 to 45 seconds. Somebody apparently opened the back door of the kitchen. Deer gets out the back, goes on with the deer's life. The restaurant gets a deep clean. Life goes on. Also out of our Southern Bureau, the Texas Rangers celebrating big time today in their victory parade after they beat the Arizona Diamondbacks for their first World Series win. Officials were expecting around half a million people at the parade. A lot of fans say they were waiting 50 years for this moment. Amazing for them. Congratulations. Coming up. One time crypto whiz kid Sam Bankman Freed now facing the potential of life behind bars. We're talking about his stunning rise and fall in the crypto world, going behind the scenes with our CNBC reporter Kate Rooney, who's covered every bit of it. Plus, that big storm in Europe bringing a whole lot more rain, getting even deadlier now. How this got so dangerous. Next. Tonight, a record-breaking storm slamming Europe, where a lot of wind, a lot of rain, now smashing into parts of Italy, Spain, France. It is deadly. 14 people, at least, killed so far. Look at this. In Italy, a woman and her dog had to be rescued from their house. They were taken out. See that on a raft, that red raft there? Because the flood water was so high. It comes as we're learning, this was the... This was the warmest, potentially, the experts think this could be the warmest year ever recorded, 2023. But... Winter is coming, and we're seeing some new maps today to show where snow may pile up over the next few months. Let's get to our Bill Karens. First, let's start with Europe here. What is going on with Western Europe? Why is the storm getting so intense and is so deadly here? Yeah, this was the equivalent of like a Category 2 hurricane. Now, it wasn't tropical in nature. It was more like a nor'easter, if you're familiar with it, or if we get like an atmospheric river event on the West Coast. That's what was happening. So here's Europe here, and there's London, and there's Dublin, and you can see where Paris is located. This was the storm coming. And this storm actually came off the coast last weekend off of New England and across the Atlantic, and then it just blew up into this very powerful storm. You can see this little, almost like a cinnamon bun, went right through the English Channel. Some of the lowest pressures ever recorded were in areas to the southern portion of just outside of London. And the lower the pressure, the stronger the storm. The highest wind gust was 104 mile per hour winds. And at the same time as the storm came in and went this way, all of the heavy rain crossed through and gusty winds went through areas of Spain and Paris and France and all the way into Italy. Italy had a lot of flooding issues with this. And that's going to be the biggest thing. Also, I saw that in France, uh, over 1 million people lost power with this storm, too. So the storm is now gone. The effects are over with. They've had a day of recovery today. But uh, yeah, by their standards, this was very strong. Um, talk to me about what we're hearing about heat today, right? Because you've got this, you've got the potential for snow, which we know it was going to hit in the next <laughs> few months, obviously this winter, but then also the heat breaking records. Uh, warmest October, we think, right? We're finding out. Yeah, so we're starting to add up all the numbers from you know, what happened in uh, October and then also throughout the year. And it's all tied to El Nino. So this is what, you know, this is a natural occurrence. It switches back and forth between La Nino and El Nino. This is a bigger driver of the change in temperatures on our planet than even climate change. So we have the climate change part built in. That's the warming that we've caused us humans burning fossil fuels. And then on top of that, we get El Nino and La Nina. So this is over the last year. So we had the cooler La Nina, but it was kind of, you know, taken away from 
from what we've done to our planet with global warming. Now that we've actually seen it increasing, the last number was 1.5. Just look at the graph and you can see it's getting stronger and stronger. So that's why we're seeing that that combined with what we've done to our planet with global warming, now we're seeing it very warm. So we don't quite yet have what we call a super El Nino. We had those in 97 and 2015 and 83. These were all years where we had horrific flooding and problems in the West. And right now we're at 1.5. If we get above two, we call that a super El Nino. And if we get there, it would happen likely in the next couple of months as we're expecting it to peak then. And of course, you know, the impacts of this, this time of year, everyone wants to know how much is it going to snow? Yeah. When is it going to snow? So here's a map that is sent out um, by our friends at the government, NOAA, the climate uh, division, of in a typical moderate to strong El Nino, where does it snow more or less? Everywhere in the brown is much below normal. Expect to see a lot less stories out of Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo. Lake effect snow should be minimized. I'm not going to get none, but less than normal. And especially northern New England. And all my ski friends don't like this map at all in the Adirondacks or the mountains of Vermont or New Hampshire and Maine. But if you've talked to anyone in the Mid-Atlantic, they're like, hey, we have a chance for a big snowstorm this winter. Anyone in D.C. or Richmond, those areas? Because occasionally we can get a coastal storm that produces heavy snow even during El Nino. Now, you'll probably be wearing shorts the rest of the time, but if we time up that cold air with this big storm, there's the possibility here. And for all our friends in the West, usually we would get a decent amount of snow in the mountains of the California, and that would be great. We had it last year. We'd love to do it again, fill the reservoirs up even more. So that would be fantastic. Fantastic. But the northern Rockies is one of those areas that has less. And as far as you were wondering and about uh, what we just got done with as far as the warmest temperatures went, well, we did see October being the warmest ever recorded on this planet. And we are on pace to have this year beat 2016 as the warmest year ever recorded. Now, again, it's because we already have it built in burning of fossil fuels, the warming of the planet, then the wow. strong El Nino on top of it. That's why this will end up being the warmest year ever. And because the oceans are still toasty warm, next year we'll probably beat this year. Bill, I'm telling you, you always make us smarter. Thank you so much. I deeply appreciate you. <laughs> it's a lot you. of numbers. You have to have a really good attention span, too. Well, good thing we do, and so does our audience. Appreciate you. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight it is a story that has captured the attention of so many people in this country. The fall of the former crypto king, Sam Bankman Freed, from basically head of the crypto world now to convicted convict, essentially, who could spend the rest of his life in prison after a jury found him guilty on all counts of a whole bunch of fraud and conspiracy charges in one of the biggest financial fraud trials in American history. Remember, it's all related to the collapse of his company, FTX, for stealing billions of dollars from customers and defrauding investors. Now, there's lots of questions. Like, what does this mean for the future of the crypto industry? It was booming during the pandemic. Look at this. You see the peak, September 2021, a $2.5 trillion industry here, crashing down to about half that now. I want to bring in our CNBC tech reporter, Kate Rooney, who has been on the front lines of all things crypto, including this SBF stuff. Kate, let's talk about this first. You've been there every step of the way from when he was a 30-year-old billionaire to now a felon over the course of just a year, right? We're showing some of your coverage here. Pull back the curtain. Take us behind the scenes with you. What's been some of the wildest moments? What's the stuff that you didn't expect in the course of this? Well, Holly, one of the wild things is just the velocity at which all of this happened. You talked about the, the pre convict Sam Bankman Freed. It's hard to underestimate how big of an influence he had on this industry. He was seen as the credible face of crypto in Washington, D.C. He was hanging out with Tom Brady and every celebrity you can name. There was photos in some of these testimonies and in evidence about with him at the Super Bowl with Katy Perry and you name it. So he really was a big deal. He was worth a ton of money. And he also, there was this endearing, humble side of him where he said he was going to give 99% away of his wealth away to charity. So he seemed like this humble, do-good billionaire who was trying to save the world while also the head of this industry. It's just such a rapid fall from grace. It's really hard to understate what a big deal he was. Flash forward to a year. It's just been a year. So you think about Theranos, Bernie Madoff, all of those big yes. cases. Those took years to play out. This happened November of last year. The company goes bankrupt. Here we are. He's got he's now an official convicted felon, which is just wild to even say out loud, thinking of where we were a year ago, Holly. 
This, um, I was interested to read. I'm like obsessed with the whole crypto world, Kay. I love what you've done on it. I've been reading, a you know, there's just this New York Times piece and analysis out that has, it says, and again, analysis, not a news yeah. piece, but that says, as journalists and now prosecutors have made clear, FTX and Alameda were run by a group of hapless young people who did not have the required skills, maturity, or patience. I wonder how you see it, Kate, if you think that is a fair characterization as you've watched some of the key players here. Everybody, I think, knows SBF, but there's a lot of other players involved in this, too. Hallie, he's, he's dead on there. I mean, I, he said it, not me, so I'm glad I can quote him. But I spent a lot of time at these crypto conferences. I have covered this industry. I'm not that old, but you, you feel old in these <laughs> conferences you go to. It's a bunch of I mean, largely male, young people who are extremely confident that they're going to change the world and that if you don't believe them, you're wrong. So there's this sense of pushing back on some of these guys. They say, oh, well, you just don't understand it. You don't get it. And we're going to change the world. And the tagline was actually, have fun staying poor. It was sort of a joke within crypto that we're making mm. so much money and you're not. And we're the smartest thing. And then Sam really was, um, uh, was sort of encapsulating that. At, at, but there was no one, there was no adults in the room, Hallie. That's really what John Ray, who's, who's running the bankruptcy side of this at FTX, he said there were no adults, which I can vouch for having covered this. And there was no risk team. There was no CFO. So absolutely playing out in the bankruptcy side as well. Pull back to the industry at large that you, if you, as you talk about, you covered so much. It seemed like at one point crypto really was going to run the world, right? People like Tom Brady were pulled in, like, you know, regular people at home, too. It was, it was crushing until it wasn't, right? Does it change how you cover crypto, or how are you thinking about covering this industry now from just a business perspective, but also for us here on, on NBC on the non-business side of the house? So there, there are these hype cycles. I've covered it since 2017, which was really the first big bull run. And then it goes through what they call a crypto winter. So you get these kind of quiet periods and then it comes back. I am absolutely expecting that we will see another boom and bust cycle in tech, probably AI next, potentially crypto. And it, it's just a good reminder of that, that there are these hype cycles. People get ahead of themselves. Companies fail. People lose money. There is fraud in a lot of these new technologies. So yeah. it's just a good reminder as a journalist. But I absolutely expect more boom and bust going forward. It's just so fascinating. Kate Rooney, I will be part of your hype cycle any day. I appreciate you. Thank you for all your coverage this week. It's Thank been great you. seeing you. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. We are coming on the air with a divide over a potential pause in the Israel-Hamas war, with Israel pushing back, saying that is not going to happen until all hostages are released. The fighting intensifying, more people in Gaza losing their homes, and new controversy over the potential targeting of an ambulance. We're live on the ground. Plus, an eight-year-old boy getting cancer treatment. His mom stuck in Israel, separated from the rest of their family in Gaza ever since this war began, when they may be reunited in tonight's original. Then a scary moment in the air after a passenger's backpack explodes. We're going to explain. Plus, the judge in the Trump civil fraud trial expanding a gag order now after some spicy hearings this week and ahead of Mr. Trump's testimony next week. We'll take it to New York and we'll take it to a court in Utah where a mom who wrote a book about grief is appearing for, before a judge accused of killing her own husband. Her lawyer asking for more time to defend things like why see she searched what's a lethal dose of fentanyl before he died. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight, divided messages coming out of the Middle East over a temporary pause in fighting. Even as you take a look here at what the Gaza skyline is looking like tonight, you see that? Flashes of light, flares, and missiles lighting up the sky. As the Israeli military says, in just the last couple hours, their forces are going deeper into Gaza. Israel retaliating after that Hamas terror attack nearly a month ago. The Israeli military also responding to accusations from Hamas. Israeli forces targeted ambulances like this one and hospitals in Gaza. The Israelis say one of their airstrikes did hit an ambulance that they say was being used by Hamas. NBC News has not been able to verify these claims. Today, the first group of Americans is now arriving at the U.S. Embassy in Cairo after crossing the Rafah border crossing between Gaza and Egypt. You're looking at this picture here. That's a, a woman and kids who arrived there today, a picture the embassy released. That's after more than 100 Americans and their families have left Gaza, according to the White House. We know that's been one of the big priorities for the Biden administration here, getting Americans out to safety. But other priorities, of course, include freeing hostages and getting more humanitarian help to innocent people inside Gaza. Here's the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, visiting today. We've been clear that as Israel conducts its campaign to defeat Hamas, how it does so matters. 
It matters because it's the right and lawful thing to do. It matters because failure to do so plays into the hands of Hamas and other terror groups. The secretary is pushing for a temporary pause in fighting, but you see him there with the Israeli prime minister. The prime minister says that is not going to happen until hostages are freed. And now, how Israel is carrying out this war is apparently becoming a growing concern among some top Biden administration officials. Not sure now if Israel can be reined in, according to current and former senior American officials. It comes as the leader of the Iran-backed militant group Hezbollah warns a wider conflict in the Middle East could now be a realistic possibility, in his words. We're going to get more into that in just a second with Matt Bradley, who's live for us in Lebanon. But I want to start with Ellison Barber, who is near the Israel-Gaza border tonight. So, Ellison, we have these messages happening right now from U.S. and Israeli officials. From the U.S. side, it's like, hey, temporary pause. They're specifically not calling it a ceasefire. The Israelis are saying absolutely not, because we're hearing tonight the IDF even say morale on the ground in the midst of this fighting is good. They are planning to move in, it sounds like, even further into Gaza. Talk us through it. Yeah, you know, it's been interesting throughout this entire war, and I think back to the last time when Secretary of State Antony Blinken was here and also when President Biden made his visit to Tel Aviv. And shortly after President Biden had left, there was NBC News reporting at the time that U.S. officials were saying that there was a bit of an effort and some outreach talking about the idea of some sort of humanitarian pause, saying they wanted Israel to consider it just at least until more humanitarian aid could actually make its way in and also possibly that some foreign nationals could get out. And it was interesting to hear the U.S. say that at the time because Netanyahu's language was still very strong on what they plan to do. And when you look at local polls that have been in the Israeli newspaper, the reality on the ground then and still now is this. The majority of Israeli citizens seem to support this war and the efforts to eradicate Gaza of Hamas and also the efforts in this war, which is what Netanyahu says, to get hostages out of Israel. But support for Netanyahu and just confidence in the Israeli government in a lot of polls has been at an all-time low. And it's not because of what they're doing inside of Gaza right now. It's because of the security failures that happened uh, in the lead-up to the terror attack on October 7th. So at one point, we were speaking with different experts on this of saying, do you think Netanyahu will listen to the United States here? And they said he'll listen, yes. But one thing, it's one thing to listen. It's another thing to actually do it. And Netanyahu has consistently seemed to be more influenced by public opinion inside of Israel versus what allies like the United States, no matter how important they are to Israel, are saying about this. And the polling inside of Israel right now, most Israelis support the war and the effort of fully dismantling Hamas and ridding them from Gaza. And even just anecdotally, in the weeks when we've spoken to people, there has been this massive push of just a, this happened on October 7th. There must be a response and it must be forceful. And Netanyahu does seem to have the backing still of the Israeli public public in making those decisions. And that's why I think we're seeing him even after meeting with Secretary of State Anthony Blinken saying, no, this is what Israel is doing. And Israel is making its own decisions here, because that's also a narrative they've sort of tried to push and kind of take back because viewers, just the public opinion perception of Israel changed so much after October 7th. Netanyahu has really tried to take back command uh, post October 7th. And I think we're still seeing that happen now. Hallie. Ellison, can you just reflect for a second on what it's what it's like for you there and what it's um, sort of what the what the reality is on the ground that may be hard for us to see as people who are not, you know, seeing it through a TV screen. We're seeing it two dimensionally here. You know, I think a lot of times when we're covering things that are hard and complicated, it's very easy to forget that multiple things can be true at the same time, that mm. something horrific happened here on October 7th, and a lot of civilians were massacred, terrorized, and life has forever changed for Israelis. You can't underestimate how significant October 7th was. But then at the same time, there is the reality of what is happening inside of Gaza, the fact that a lot of people are dying and being injured every single single day. There is nowhere for most of the civilians to go to try and find some bit of safety. It is a reality that there are rules of war that have been ratified by 196 states in the Geneva Convention, saying that all warring parties have an obligation to limit the toll on civilians. And we've heard the U.S. make this point in their meetings uh, publicly talking and also behind the scenes with Israeli officials of saying what happened here was terrible, but Israel is supposed to be a democracy. You have to be better than a terrorist organization with Hamas. And I think just the scale of devastation 
of this war. It's hard to put into words every single day, but the reality, Hallie, is that it is disproportionately happening right now to civilians inside of Gaza. And a lot of the people being impacted are children who, first of all, absolutely did not vote for Hamas back in 2006. They weren't even born. And people who have not had an opportunity to have a say in what their government is for decades post and probably weren't even alive for it when the, all of this Hamas taking power of Gaza Strip even happened to begin with. Hallie. Ellison Barber, live for us there along the Israel-Gaza border. We're glad to have you there. Ellison, thank you. Matt, let me come to you now because we've talked several times, um, many times over the course of the last several weeks here, about the potential that this conflict could grow into something bigger regionally, which would be um, make it an already incredibly difficult international crisis even more complicated here. We are now hearing finally for the first time from the leader of Hezbollah, that militant group inside Lebanon. You were there during a, a rally, I think it was, during the speech, right, or at least people gathering, people getting together to listen to this. Talk me through some of what we should be thinking about as it relates to the Lebanese factor. Yeah, I mean, Hallie, so we weren't at the speech. No one was at the speech because actually, you right. know, this Hezbollah head, Hassan Nasrallah, he prefers to just deliver his speeches by video. We were at a huge rally, uh, one of several throughout Beirut and throughout Lebanon where people were watching this speech. And the crowd was really energized. I mean, they've been waiting for four weeks to hear their beloved leader finally address the public. A lot of them were waiting for war. We spoke with them and they said they are so ready to go and fight and die for Hezbollah, to defend the Palestinian people. And that is exactly the kind of red meat that Hezbollah had Hassan Nasrallah was throwing at his public. We spoke with one man, and I can tell you, Hallie, this guy, the last Hezbollah rally we were at, he was there too when we spoke to him. He's kind of a super fan. Um, he loves Hezbollah. He was loving Hassan Nasrallah. He's an English teacher. You'll see that clearly. He speaks English very well. Here's what he had to say. So tell me. What did you think of this speech? Okay, as you, I, as you can see, there's a kind of escalation. What's going on in Gaza must stop one way or another. So, Hallie, was it escalation? We don't really know. I'm not sure that Hassan Nasrallah really meant it to be that way. You know, as you know, you work in politics. It's hard to know whether, you know, the audience takes the same message that the person presenting it is supposed to be giving. Hassan Nasrallah was very, very careful in what he said. He said that all of the options were open and he could escalate. But it didn't sound like he was necessarily declaring war, which was clearly what a lot of the folks in this audience wanted to hear. But it looked as though Hassan Nasrallah, after four weeks of not saying anything at all, still wanted to leave his options open. He was basically saying that there are two things that could decide to tip the balance if the West, I mean, he didn't say this precisely, decides to attack Lebanon or Hezbollah specifically, then they could launch a war. Or if they are upset with the way in which the Israelis are launching their attacks against the Gaza Strip, then they could launch a war too. The question is, there's already been a lot of attacks on the Gaza Strip, so what is he waiting for? Matt Bradley, live for us there in Lebanon. Matt, we're glad to have you there. Thank you. As we talk about American priorities in this war for the Biden administration, including getting Americans out of Gaza, um, I want to bring in now somebody who has just very recently, in the last 24 hours, crossed that border out of Gaza into Egypt. Emily Rauschenberger had been visiting Gaza with her family, her husband, her kids. She lives in the U.K. now. She was born and raised in Illinois. First of all, thank you so much for being with us. How are you doing? Where where are you? Um, we're uh, in the Intercontinental Hotel in Cairo, um, brought here by the uh, American consulate once we pass through the Egyptian-Palestinian uh, border. Um, of course, we're doing much better. We have running water and food and and uh, um, all essentials, so we're, um, we're infinitely better than 24 hours prior. I have to ask, I mean, you had been visiting Gaza with your husband, with your kids. Did you ever think you would end up stuck for weeks in this just horrific situation? What was the process like getting out? Um, no, this is beyond any imagination uh, of a situation we thought we could be in. Um, the process of getting out was torturous. You know, we thought in the early days, and whenever we went to visit family uh, in Gaza, you know, we, we thought, you know, if anything happened, you know, usually foreign nationals are allowed out before really uh, intensive uh, military campaigns are, are, are waged. So it, it was, came as a shock what happened on October 7th. And, and by October 9th, we had to leave our homes uh, by order of Israel because they were bombing the area uh, intensively from that night on. And so, um, 
getting out, you know, we tried the first two times that the uh, American embassy said it might possibly open in the, during those first few, few days. Um, but again, it never did open. And as you probably reported, it was bombed by Israel. So we were, um, we were stuck really. And, uh, we had ultimately sought refuge in an apartment building outside of Khan Yunus in the South, uh, and just waited for news. And it, it just seemed like forever, um, but on um, on Wednesday and Thursday, you know, we heard of the border opening and we're on the list uh, yesterday, me and my children uh, as American citizens. We are dual British nationals now with my husband, a uh, British uh, citizen, but he was not on the list. So it was we were prepared to to go and leave him and hope that he would come in, in other days. But um, thankfully, we were able after a whole day of, of waiting and struggle to to pass the border with him with us. So that was a relief, but also a heartbreak because we left behind the whole the whole family we'd been visiting and uh, all the friends and loved ones in Gaza that are struggling so much. What are the conditions like for them? What were they like when you were there in that apartment building, you said? And, the, and just so people know, that was the southern part of the Gaza Strip where you were staying closer, obviously, to where that border crossing was. I understand that you and your family showed up, I want to say, three or four times, thinking that perhaps that was going to be the day where you could get out. It wasn't, obviously, until this week that that happened. But can you, can you tell us more about the conditions that you were in, that your family was in? Uh, again, very horrendous. Um, we were in, uh, we found an apartment that we could stay in with, with the whole extended family. So we had about 30 people in the apartment um, from an 80, my 80 year old mother in law to uh, a two year old baby. Um, you know, we we kind of just banded together. And some people in the morning at dawn, when, when some of the bombing subsided, subsided would go you know, go and get in the bread lines, whether in the area or in more into the city in Khan Yunus, because it was very hard to find bread. Other people went to to find water, like the next water source to fill up jugs. Um, others looked after the kids uh, and, and still others we sent to to try to find a solar, um, a source of solar energy to charge our devices to keep informed. But, you know, at the end, you had just have inc just increasing bombardment and the, the psychological stress and the physical conditions. Everyone is struggling. It's it's like the Walking Dead, really, as, as you just struggling to um, to find the necessities. What is your message to the Biden administration now, Emily? Um, I know that, of course, Secretary of State, as we talked about a minute ago, is in, is in the region, Tony Blinken. There had been this push. I know the embassy workers had, had worked with you, I believe, and, and other Americans to get you out. What do you want them to know? Um, that a ceasefire is, is needs, needs to happen. There needs to be greater pressure because nobody is going to benefit from the destruction of, of the Gaza Strip and all the 2.3 million people there, most of which who are just trying to survive in their situation. Um, you know, we, again, we see our family there that have lived there generations and generations. You know, most people in the Gaza Strip, 70 percent are, are refugees from 1948 that, you know, had to make Gaza their home after Israel was created. And but my, my in-laws are people originally from Gaza. And this is, you know, this has been, um, you know, a, a very huge struggle in the past 20 years just to to find a job, to find sustenance, to find an education for your family. And and so, you know, the bombardment and the killing of, of so many innocent civilians um, who have no place else to go is, is a humanitarian disaster that we that does not accomplish any any of the goals Israel or Americans or or Palestinians want to see, and I, I just I just need to emphasize like there needs to be a better way to to go through this conflict and find uh, answers for for both sides. Emily Rauschenberger, thank you so much for your time tonight. I know it's been uh, a, obviously a harrowing few weeks for you. We are glad that you and your family are safe and headed back home. Thank you. We've been talking about the Biden administration's response to obviously what's happening in that war between Israel and Hamas. It comes as President Biden back here in the United States is in Maine tonight as we speak, reiterating his call as it relates to domestic policy for new gun laws after visiting with first responders from last week's mass shooting there. This is about common sense, reasonable, responsible measures to protect our children, our families, our communities. The president and first lady also meeting with families and victims of that horrific attack at a bar and bowling alley in the town of Lewiston. 18 people died there, making it the deadliest mass shooting in America so far this year. 
George Solis is joining us now. And George, give us a sense of what it's like for the community there nine days after this shooting. It is a um, just a, a, a sad and solemn ritual for the president to come and do these kinds of visits. We've seen him do it before. Walk us through it. That's right, Hallie. The president putting on his consoler in chief cap, not a role that he relishes at all, talking about some of his own grief, his own experiences, and the first ladies going to the sites of these mass shootings, Uvalde, Sandy Hook, Monterey Park. And each time he says it's, it's hard, it's too many to count, he said during his remarks here at the bowling alley. By the way, a giant memorial here growing from people, not just locally, but from around uh, the country coming to pay their respects to all of those 18 lives lost here, as well as those that were injured, which is something the president also referenced, those people that survived this mass shooting and the scars that they live with. The president, of course, as you heard, calling for sensible gun reform. He's also thanking all of the first responders and nurses that made the difference in saving some of those lives during the horrific shooting that occurred here. Many in this community, of course, waiting for the president to arrive here along with the first lady, paying their respects at the bar and grill, laying some flowers there, and then coming to the bowling alley to deliver those remarks. And now, as you mentioned, he is meeting privately with those family members of the victims here. The president, uh, well received during his remarks. All of this comes, of course, as people are coming to this memorial. Talked to some, two teenagers today who were paying their respect. One of them saying that they actually had to perform an active shooter drill at their school, which was not something they had ever done. This was only something that was discussed, but that is sort of the new norm in this community. And they now fall into a category like so many others, tragically, that have to live with this experience. Uh, here's what that uh, teen told me, Hallie. Thinking about it and thinking about it happening to you at school or anywhere is um, not normal. And I think just feeling normal during this kind of thing would be kind of weird because it's not something that should be normal. Um, it's not something we should ever have to practice or get used to. Not something they should ever have to get used to. All of this, of course, coming as the first funerals for the victims are taking place this weekend. This community will try and heal in time, Hallie. But as we have know and we've seen time and time again, it does take a long time. Hallie. George Solis, live for us there in Lewiston. George, thank you for being there uh, on the ground there as President Biden is also on the ground. Appreciate it. Let's take it to New York now with that gag order that former President Trump's under in that civil tax fraud case. Now getting even larger, it is now expanding to include Mr. Trump's attorneys. It's because the judge is not at all pleased with the shots his staff is taking, specifically his law clerk. And it got pretty spicy in courts and back and forth over that today, which took away some attention from this. Eric Trump's testimony in a case where prosecutors accused Mr. Trump of lying about how much his business is worth. After court, you saw Eric taking a page out of his father's playbook, calling the whole thing a political witch hunt. They've dragged on and I, and you often play that collateral damage. They only want our names in this thing because it sensationalizes the case. We've done absolutely nothing wrong. We have a better company than they could have ever imagined. Come Monday, of course, next in line is the former president himself set to be on the stand testifying. I want to bring in Lindsay Reiser covering the latest for us. So, Lindsay, new gag order now after a bunch of drama in court. Why is it that the law clerk has become such a central figure here? Well, Chris Kais, Trump's attorney, continues to imply in the courtroom that this clerk is biased and politically leaning to the left. And the judge is furious over this. He's already issued a partial limited gag order preventing all parties from making public comments about members of his staff or posting about them. And now it has expanded. Essentially, the judge saying, and I want to go ahead and read, uh, let me just pull this up, all counsel are prohibited from making any public statements in or out of court that refer to any confidential communications in any form between my staff and me. And Hallie, this has to do with something that happened we talked about yesterday before court adjourned and there was some no passing between the clerk and the judge. The judge says that he has an unfettered right to talk to members of his staff in his gag order. He cited the New York rule that allows this to happen and says, in fact, it is the principal, it is the primary role of the principal law clerk to help a judge adjudicate their responsibilities. And so he went on in this gag order, Hallie, to say, since the commencement of this bench trial, my chambers have been inundated with hundreds of harassing and threatening phone calls, voicemails, emails, letters, and packages. No comment yet from Trump's attorneys, Hallie. 
What about um, the ex expectation for testimony from Mr. Trump himself next week, that Ivanka Trump on the stand? Do we expect that it's going to reflect some of what we heard from Eric Trump, for example, as he was pressed about some of these financial statements and his involvement with, like, the, you know, the, the money piece of the business? Yeah, and, and there was a definite stylistic difference between the testimony we heard today and that of Don Jr. Don Jr. seemed very relaxed, at times was joking with the judge. Eric Trump seemed much more nervous, according to our producer, in the courtroom, and look, often scanned the courtroom, looking to the defense table as well. And things got heated sometimes during the questioning. Remember, these are the state's witnesses, so this direct examination is with the Office of the Attorney General. And, and at one point, Eric today said, well, of course I know there are financial statements. This is a huge organization. The Attorney General's office trying to drill down on those documents that they say contain overvalued assets to help them get better terms. And so on Monday, you mentioned the former president will be here to testify. We saw Secret Service today getting a lay of the land, and we can certainly expect uh, more fireworks in the courtroom on Monday. Um, and we can also potentially expect him to say similar things to what Don Jr. Eric did, and that is he relied on other people, the accountants, former CFO Alan Weisselberg, uh, to, to essentially help them with the appraisal that they weren't focused on things that were that granular. You mentioned Ivanka scheduled for testimony on Wednesday. She had appealed the subpoena to testify. The appellate division denied that, and so it looks like we will see her on Wednesday. And Hallie, we don't exactly have the greatest idea of what she's going to talk about because she hasn't been deposed yet. We have video right. deposition of the other Trump family members, but we have not heard yet. We can expect the attorney general's office, though, to ask her questions. They say she has intimate knowledge of the business dealings, Hallie. Lindsay Reiser, live for us there in New York. I'm sure we will talk again next week, Lindsay. Thank you. Coming up, controversial Congressman George Santos opening up about what his future could hold tonight, what he says he'll do even if he gets kicked out of Congress. Plus, new warnings in India after the air quality in one of its biggest cities hit severe levels. What's to blame later on? The author accused of poisoning and killing her husband with fentanyl is back in court today. You're taking a live look now inside that courtroom out in Utah with the judge trying to set a calendar here after Corey Richens' lawyer asked for more time to get familiar with some evidence. Evidence like changes, prosecutors say, in the couple's life insurance policy before Eric Richens' death. Evidence like Corey Richens' alleged internet searches of things like, what's a lethal dose of fentanyl? Corey Richens' mother and brother defending her during an ABC News interview today. Watch. I do not believe in my heart Corey could ever not just kill Eric, but kill anything or anyone. She loves her, her boys way too much to, to take their father away from them. Remember, Richens is, to this point, probably best known for her children's book focused on grief which she wrote after her husband, who she's now accused of murdering, died. She denies all the accusations against her and says she's innocent. Danny Savalos is joining us now. There's um, a lot of discussion in this case, and specifically today, about the idea, about the situation of what's called a walk the dog letter. W what does that mean? What's that about? It's not a criminal procedure thing. It is a title that was placed on the top of a letter that the prosecution alleges was really a directive or an instruction manual that the defendant gave to family members telling them to testify falsely. Now, the defense has said, there it is right there, walk the dog at the top. The defense has said, on the other hand, look, this is just a novel that she was penning while in prison. And the defense has fired back saying, essentially, look, there was a gag order in this case. So when the prosecution took this letter and stuck it on the public filing system, it was the prosecution that violated the gag order by putting this out into the ether. So each side firing at each other side. The only part that I have to say I find mildly confusing is I understand the prosecution being concerned about witness tampering. But I would hardly, if I were the prosecutors, want her to stop talking to her family at all. Look at all the evidence it generates when she is allowed free communication with people from from prison or jail. Any insight into the potential motive here? 
The prosecution has a ton of evidence on motive, and I expect that to be the defense's defense, is that to concede, look, there's a lot of evidence of things like insurance policies taken out on the victim. Uh, the defendant arguably had a lot to gain financially by the victim's death, and she had a lot of debt. The prosecution appears to have plenty of evidence of that. Uh, that is uh, not the same as having evidence of actually spiking the husband's drink with fentanyl. They do have evidence of that as well. But when it comes to motive, this is one of those cases where the prosecution is heavy on motive evidence, and they're going to rely on that a lot. Well, the medical examiner said that Eric, the husband here, had five times the lethal dosage of fentanyl in his system when he died. And according to evidence from the county sheriff's office, Richens said Eric had suspected that his wife had tried to poison him before. He'd actually warned his family about this. What is a defense strategy here that could be effective in front of a jury? Well, this is one of those cases where the prosecution has shut off increasingly more and more avenues for the defense. So really, the defense has only a few options, and one of those is going to be, sure, there may be evidence that there was fentanyl in the system, and maybe Eric was worried about his wife poisoning him, but there's no evidence that it uh, was the defendant who actually poisoned the victim. Uh, if there are many other possibilities, including that the defendant poisoned himself. Therefore, reasonable doubt exists. I'm just riffing here, but that really is one of just a few options that the defense has here. Danny Savalos, we're going to see how this one unfolds. Thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the Supreme Court today agreeing to look at whether a Trump-era ban on so-called bump stocks on guns is illegal. Remember, bump stocks are these, like, things you add to help semi-automatic rifles fire faster. The Biden administration is defending the ban, which former President Trump put in place after that mass shooting in Vegas in 2017. Number two, Congressman George Santos is telling CNN today he plans to run for his seat next year, even if he were to get kicked out of Congress. He just survived an expulsion vote this week. Santos has admitted to not telling the truth about his background. He's been indicted on federal fraud charges and pleaded not guilty. Number three, NBC News exclusively reporting that former President Barack Obama advised the Biden White House on its AI strategy over the past five months. Aid said it's the first time the president has tapped his former boss to help with a policy initiative. Number four, Starbucks says it's planning to add 17,000 more locations by the end of the decade outside North America. An executive said three out of every four new stores in the near term will probably be international. Number five, a very rare blue diamond is going up for auction in Geneva. That is it. Could be yours if you have an extra $50 million sitting around. Christie's, I, I don't. You might. Christie's says the diamond is internally flawless and the biggest of its kind, it's 17 and a half carats. That's something. Pretty scary moments on a JetBlue plane here. We're going to show you here when a portable charger, a backpack basically, explodes on boards. Uh, look at this. You're, you're going to see people pouring water on this guy's stuff right after this charger catches fire in the backpack. You have flight attendants, even some passengers, jumping in to try to contain the flames. People are getting off the, the plane. It's an evacuation there. They're getting off because the plane was still at the gate. It was getting ready for takeoff. So that is obviously helpful to get people to evacuate. The passenger says he doesn't even know what kind of battery he had there, but most portable chargers these days use lithium ion. Those batteries are used in a lot of things, vape pens, cell phones, tablets, laptops, even electric toothbrushes. Tom Costello is joining us now. So these batteries are super common. Yeah. This, this is a scary situation, right? Two things are true. So what do you do? How do you mitigate the, the risk of this? Well, this has been an ongoing problem with uh, these things catching fire on planes. And we just checked the FDA, the FDA, the FAA numbers here. They're rather concerning here. Uh, 491 cases since 2006. Just this year, year to date, through early October, 60. What does that mean? It means almost two a week yeah. of these instances, not always fires, smoke, overheating, whatever, 60 already this year. What does that mean for us? Well, the concern is, of course, if these things catch fire in flight, that could be a real, real problem. And that is why the FAA requires airlines to tell you when you go to your to check in with your flight, you're not checking any batteries, are you, right? The last time you checked a bag, remember, they say that to you, don't check it any batteries. It comes up on when you go to check in for your boarding pass. Correct. It says you have lithium-ion batteries, whatever you're checking. You can carry it on board in your carry-ons, but don't check it underneath because if you have a fire in the cargo hold, we could have a serious problem because that's beneath your feet, right? Now, yes, there are smoke detectors and there are fire
fire detectors and there's halon that will be dispersed if there's a fire in the cargo hold. Nobody wants to take a chance like that. What are people supposed to do considering this is everywhere? Like, in other words, would it go so far as to ban, like, is it even possible to ban lithium-ion batteries so. from a plane? But think about the numbers here. You know, we all carry, most have more than I one. I have an electric toothbrush. I got about three yeah. that, uh, of, of these devices I'm, that I carry with me on board a plane, right? So multiply that times 200 people, 600 of these items are on board a flight, on any given flight. Yeah. So you could imagine the potential risk here. What does that mean? If your battery is showing any signs of, of degradation, if there's chipping, if it looks like it's overheating regularly, if there's anything that doesn't look right, get it replaced and specifically don't bring it on board a plane in that kind of a condition. Planes also have these special bags, containment bags that they can throw your device in. God forbid you have a fire, but let's not get to that point. It was just so interesting to see, I think, people jumping into action in that video from right. JetBlue, which we can show again here, the, right? The dumping the water on the thing and everything else. I mean, it, they, they were at the gate, scary which is moment. a good thing, but definitely a scary moment. Yeah, and literally, they all describe this as an explosion. We didn't catch the explosion on video, but uh, very concerning people jumping off and a lot of commotion, and the guy whose bag it is, uh, his name is Jimmy Levy. He said he had just put his head back, leaned against the window, waiting for people to board, started to nod off, and suddenly his bag exploded. Yeah. So that'll wake you up. Pretty He's not in trouble, is he? No, no, yeah. he did nothing wrong. Yeah. Uh, it it would have been a problem if we were in the cargo hold, though. Absolutely. Tom Costello, thank you for breaking that down for us. What, a, what a wild times we live in. Appreciate it. <laughs> When we come back, the war between Israel and Hamas separating thousands of families. Our team has the story of one young cancer patient in Jerusalem who can't get home in tonight's original. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. Thousands of people in Gaza cross into Israel for medical treatment every year, but now some of them are stuck with Israel and Hamas in this ongoing war. Our team talked with one young patient getting cancer treatment and his mom separated from the rest of their family and not able to get home. Here's Josh Letterman. In the hills of East Jerusalem, in a historic church older than the state of Israel, there is a hospital where one half of a Gaza family is now stuck. And how old are you? Oh, I am it. It was leukemia that brought Ali to Jerusalem for treatment and a war that's keeping him here. Can you point to me where it hurts? He touches his chest, where there's a chemotherapy port, and shows off the English he's learned in the hospital. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Nice job. Give me five. Ali is from Gaza City, ground zero for Israel's war against Hamas, a response to the brutal October 7th attacks on civilians. His family says their Gaza home is damaged from nearby bombing, but still standing for now. Ali's father and three siblings are still there. When he and his mom call, often there's no reply and they fear the worst. But sometimes the calls go through. He says, I call my brothers. They are hungry and afraid. A month-long hospital stay has turned into six weeks and counting. For now, there's no going back to Gaza. What do you hear from your husband back in Gaza? She tells me they have no running water, no electricity. The kids keep telling her husband how hungry they are. And after 10 days without a shower, they're unclean. After Ali is sedated for treatment, May Jalal tells me she's sleeping on a cot at her son's bedside. Her Israeli permit is only valid for the hospital grounds. She can't leave even for groceries for fear of arrest. She says, I feel stress in my chest and can't breathe, but I pray to God and I have hope. There are roughly 9,000 cancer patients in the Gaza Strip and many more in the occupied West Bank. Just a fraction of them are receiving treatment here in Israel, but it's not without great personal cost to their families. Last year, just over 20,000 Gaza patients applied for permits to cross into Israel for medical treatment, according to the World Health Organization. About two-thirds were approved. Dr. Fadi Arasham runs Augusta Victoria Hospital in East Jerusalem, a mostly Palestinian area claimed by both Israel and the Palestinians. In normal times, nearly 40% of the patients come from Gaza. There is no alternative for them to go get radiation or any other treatment in Gaza. He says the war doesn't just affect patients psychologically, but also medically. We had a patient who was about to start a bone marrow transplantation on the day where we uh, were supposed to start the procedure. Her house was demolished. 
we postponed uh, the procedure. In Gaza, there is only one cancer treatment hospital, and the Palestinian Health Ministry says it's been damaged by airstrikes and now totally shut down after fuel ran out. Claims NBC News can't independently verify. Back in Jerusalem, Ali wakes up from sedation and gets a visit from red-nosed doctors who blow bubbles and sing to him in Arabic. For Ali, there is hope with the right treatment, and there are dreams. Ali tells me of his love of football and Spider-Man, how he hopes to become an engineer in Gaza like his dad. Moments of optimism breaking through for one family split apart by war. And Hallie, it's sometimes lost in all the focus on the fighting in Gaza that it's not just Palestinians wounded in airstrikes who need medical care, right? There's also Palestinians with heart attacks and strokes and all the other normal medical things that happen in life. So for now, nobody is getting from Gaza into Israel. The only option is into Egypt, where some have been allowed through. The Egyptians now setting up a field hospital on their side of the border, while France has sent a Navy ship to the region to try to provide additional medical relief. But for most Gazans right now, now, Hallie, the only option is what medical care, if any, they can get within the Gaza Strip. Hallie? Our thanks to Josh Letterman for that reporting. NBC News covers hundreds of other international stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our international teams have done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Ukraine, police releasing this video of people evacuating from their homes in the Donetsk region. Russia has been intensifying attacks there, and at least three people have been hurt in shelling overnight. Out of India, the capital city, New Delhi, blanketed in a thick layer of haze, essentially. You see it there. The air quality index dropped to a severe category or hit a severe category in some spots. It's so bad, some schools had to shut down. Officials say because it's cold, there's not a lot of wind, and crops are burning nearby. That's why it's getting to be like you see it here. And out of Morocco, archaeologists say they found ancient ruins they thought was once a bustling city. It's possible they date all the way back to the 5th century. They found a statue of a woman, maybe showing a god or an empress. The country hopes the discoveries might bring more tourists in the years to come. Coming up, we're going behind the scenes of one of the biggest financial frauds in American history. What our reporter who's been covering it all says has been most surprising about SBF's stunning fall. That's coming up in the backstory. Plus, what we're learning about that record-breaking storm hitting Europe in just a minute. Tonight, a record-breaking storm slamming Europe, where a lot of wind, a lot of rain, now smashing into parts of Italy, Spain, France. It is deadly. 14 people, at least, killed so far. Look at this. In Italy, a woman and her dog had to be rescued from their house. They were taken out. See that on a raft, that red raft there, because the flood water was so high. It comes as we're learning this was the... This was the warmest, potentially, the experts think this could be the warmest year ever recorded, 2023. But winter is coming, and we're seeing some new maps today to show where snow may pile up over the next few months. Let's get to our Bill Karens. First, let's start with Europe here. What is going on with Western Europe? Why is the storm getting so intense and is so deadly here? Yeah, this was the equivalent of like a Category 2 hurricane. Now, it wasn't tropical in nature. It was more like a nor'easter, if you're familiar with it, or if we get like an atmospheric river event on the West Coast. That's what was happening. So here's Europe here, and there's London, and there's Dublin, and you can see where Paris is located. This was the storm coming. And this storm actually came off the coast last weekend off of New England, and it crossed the Atlantic, and then it just blew up into this very powerful storm. You see this little, almost like a cinnamon bun, went right through the English Channel. Some of the lowest pressures ever recorded were in areas to the southern portion of just outside of London. And the lower the pressure, the stronger the storm. The highest wind gust was 104 mile per hour winds. And at the same time as the storm came in and went this way, all of the heavy rain crossed through and gusty winds went through areas of Spain and Paris and of France and all the way into Italy. Italy had a lot of flooding issues with this. And that's going to be the biggest thing. Also, I saw that in France, uh, over 1 million people lost power with this storm too. So the storm is now gone. The effects are over with. They've had a day of recovery today. But uh, yeah, by their standards, this was very strong. Um, talk to me about what we're hearing about heat today, right? Because you've got this, you've got the potential for snow, which we know it was going to hit in the next <laughs> few months, obviously this winter, but then also the heat breaking records. Uh, warmest October, we think, right? We're finding out. 
Yeah, so we're starting to add up all the numbers from you know, what happened in uh, October and then also throughout the year, and it's all tied to El Nino. So this is what, you know, this is a natural occurrence. It switches back and forth between La Nino and El Nino. This is a bigger driver of the change in temperatures on our planet than even climate change. So we have the climate change part built in. That's the warming that we've caused us humans burning fossil fuels. And then on top of that, we get El Nino and La Nina. So this is over the last year. So we had the cooler La Nina, but was kind of, you know, taken away from from what we've done to our planet with global warming. Now that we've actually seen it increasing, the last number was 1.5. Just look at the graph and you can see it's getting stronger and stronger. So that's why we're seeing that that combined with what we've done to our planet with global warming, now we're seeing it very warm. So we don't quite yet have what we call a super El Nino. We had those in 97 and 2015 and 83. These were all years where we had horrific flooding and problems in the West. And right now we're at 1.5. If we get above two, we call that a super El Nino. And if we get there, it would happen likely in the next couple of months as we're expecting it to peak then. And of course, you know, the impacts of this, this time of year, everyone wants to know how much is it going to snow? Yeah. When is it going to snow? So here's a map that is sent out um, by our friends at the government, NOAA, the climate uh, division, of in a typical moderate to strong El Nino, where does it snow more or less? Everywhere in the brown is much below normal. Expect to see a lot less stories out of Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo. Lake effect snow should be minimized. I'm not going to get none, but less than normal, and especially northern New England. And all my ski friends don't like this map at all in the Adirondacks or the mountains of Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. But if you've talked to anyone in the Mid-Atlantic, they're like, hey, we have a chance for a big snowstorm this winter. Anyone in D.C. or Richmond, those areas? Because occasionally we can get a coastal storm that produces heavy snow even during El Nino. Now, you'll probably be wearing shorts the rest of the time, but if we time up that cold air with this big storm, there's the possibility here. And for all our friends in the West, usually we would get a decent amount of snow in the mountains of the California, and that would be great. We had it last year. We'd love to do it again, fill the reservoirs up even more, so that would be fantastic. Fantastic. But the northern Rockies is one of those areas that has less. And as far as you were wondering and about uh, what we just got done with as far as the warmest temperatures went, well, we did see October being the warmest ever recorded on this planet. And we are on pace to have this year beat 2016 as the warmest year ever recorded. Now, again, it's because we already have it built in burning of fossil fuels, the warming of the planet, then the wow. strong El Nino on top of it, that's why this will end up being the warmest year ever. And because the oceans are still toasty warm, next year we'll probably beat this year. Bill, I'm telling you, you always make us smarter. Thank you so much. I deeply appreciate you. <laughs> it's a lot you. of numbers. You have to have a really good attention span, too. Well, good thing we do, and so does our audience. Appreciate you. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight it is a story that has captured the attention of so many people in this country. The fall of the former crypto king, Sam Bankman Freed, from basically head of the crypto world now to convicted convict, essentially, who could spend the rest of his life in prison after a jury found him guilty on all counts of a whole bunch of fraud and conspiracy charges in one of the biggest financial fraud trials in American history. Remember, it's all related to the collapse of his company, FTX, for stealing billions of dollars from customers and defrauding investors. Now, there's lots of questions like, what does this mean for the future of the crypto industry? It was booming during the pandemic. Look at this. You see the peak, September 2021, a two and a half trillion dollar industry here crashing down to about half that now. I want to bring in our CNBC tech reporter, Kate Rooney, who has been on the front lines of all things crypto, including this SBF stuff. Kate, let's talk about this first. You've been there every step of the way from when he was a 30-year-old billionaire to now a felon over the course of just a year, right? We're showing some of your coverage here. Pull back the curtain. Take us behind the scenes with you. What's been some of the wildest moments? What's the stuff that you didn't expect in the course of this? Well, Holly, one of the wild things is just the velocity at which all of this happened. You talked about the, the pre- convict Sam Bankman Freed. It's hard to underestimate how big of an influence he had on this industry. He was seen as the credible face of crypto in Washington, D.C. He was hanging out with Tom Brady and every celebrity you can name. There was photos in some of these testimonies and in evidence about with him at the Super Bowl with Katy Perry and you name it. So he really was a big deal. He was worth a ton of money. And he also, there was this endearing, humble side of him where he said he was going to give 99% of his wealth away to charity. So he seemed like this humble, 
do-good billionaire who was trying to save the world while also the head of this industry. It's just such a rapid fall from grace. It's really hard to understate what a big deal he was. Flash forward to a year. It's just been a year. So you think about Theranos, Bernie Madoff, all of those big yes. cases. Those took years to play out. This happened November of last year. The company goes bankrupt. Here we are. He's got. He's now an official convicted felon, which is just wild to even say out loud thinking of where we were a year ago, Holly. This, um, I was interested to read. I'm like obsessed with the whole crypto world, Kay. I love what you've done on it. I've been reading a ton, you know, there's just this New York Times piece, an analysis out that has, that says, and again, analysis, not a news yeah. piece, but that says, as journalists and now prosecutors have made clear, FTX and Alameda were run by a group of hapless young people who did not have the required skills, maturity, or patience. I wonder how you see it, Kate, if you think that is a fair characterization as you've watched some of the key players here. Everybody, I think, knows SBF, but there's a lot of other players involved in this too. Hallie, he's he's dead on there. I mean, I he said it, not me, so I'm glad I can quote him. But I spent a lot of time at these crypto conferences. I have covered this industry. I'm not that old, but you, you feel old in these <laughs> conferences you go to. It's a bunch of I mean, largely male, young people who are extremely confident that they're going to change the world and that if you don't believe them, you're wrong. So there's this sense of pushing back on some of these guys. They say, oh, well, you just don't understand it. You don't get it. And we're going to change the world. And the tagline was actually have fun staying poor. It was sort of a joke within crypto that we're making mm. so much money and you're not. And we're the smartest thing. And then Sam really was, um, uh, was sort of encapsulating that. At, at, but there was no one. There was no adults in the room, Hallie. That's really what John Ray, who's who's running the bankruptcy side of this at FTX, he said there were no adults, which I can vouch for having covered this. And there was no risk team. There was no CFO. So absolutely playing out in the bankruptcy side as well. Pull back to the industry at large that you, if you, as you talk about, you covered so much. It seemed like at one point crypto really was going to run the world, right? People like Tom Brady were pulled in, like, you know, regular people at home, too. It was, it was crushing until it wasn't, right? Does it change how you cover crypto or how are you thinking about covering this industry now from just a business perspective, but also for us here on, on NBC on the non-business side of the house? So there, there are these hype cycles. I've covered it since 2017, which was really the first big bull run. And then it goes through what they call a crypto winter. So you get these kind of quiet periods and then it comes back. I am absolutely expecting that we will see another boom and bust cycle in tech, probably AI next, potentially crypto. And it, it's just a good reminder of that, that there are these hype cycles. People get ahead of themselves. Companies fail. People lose money. There is fraud in a lot of these new technologies. So yeah. it's just a good reminder as a journalist. But I absolutely expect more boom and bust going forward. It's just so fascinating. Kate Rooney, I will be part of your hype cycle any day. I appreciate you. Thank you for <laughs> all your coverage you, this week. It's Thank been great you. seeing you. Coming up here on the show, a lot more to get to, including what's being called a freak accident on the ice, taking the life of a pro hockey player in England, the whole thing, sending shockwaves internationally in the hockey world, not just overseas, but here at home. And there is a spotlight now on the NHL and its top stars on whether they're going to do something to try to prevent anything like that from ever happening again. NBC's Noah Pransky explains. <laughs> It was sudden and horrific. Nottingham Panthers forward Adam Johnson was making his way up the ice on a seemingly routine play when a collision turned fatal. His opponent's foot flew back with the skate slashing Johnson's neck. The 29-year-old was given medical treatment on site, but according to police, was later pronounced dead at a nearby hospital. The team, which plays in the UK's Elite Ice Hockey League, called the incident a freak accident, and it's being investigated by local police who say the probe will take some time. But the tragedy prompting immediate outpouring of grief and condolences from around the ice hockey community and beyond. You know, no one should die in sport. One question now takes center ice. Is enough being done to protect hockey players moving forward? In the U.S., the NHL commissioner spoke out on ESPN's Pat McAfee show. They said there's nothing to stop players from better protecting themselves, whether it's the, the neck or, or wrists or legs, from wearing more protective equipment. Nor is there anything forcing them to. Neck guards are not mandatory in the NHL. A spokesman for the Elite Hockey League in the UK where the tragedy occurred also said they would not mandate neck protection following Johnson's death but the league encourages players to adopt it it's something that a there needs to be the appropriate education and B it's something we do in consultation with the players association 
The NHL's Player Association says the conversations are now happening. Their executive director, Marty Walsh, telling the AP, quote, we're going to explore everything. It's a change for the players, but it's also about protecting them. Some junior leagues reacting more quickly. The Western Hockey League, a major junior league in Canada, announcing players will be required to wear neck guard protection as of Friday, even during training. Hopefully there'll be an initiative here moving forward. And Pittsburgh Penguins head coach Mike Sullivan, who coached Johnson when he played in the NHL, told reporters this week that his franchise will mandate neck protection for all minor league players. That could be one of the... Um, one of the positive things that might come out of this ter terrible tragedy. But stars in the big league have a history of resisting change. Craig McTavish famously played without a helmet for nearly a decade after the league mandated them for new players. And a handful of grandfathered veterans still play today without eye protection a decade after the NHL mandated that in 2013. But after Johnson's death, one all-star voluntarily adopted new gear this week. Washington's TJ Oshie sporting a new neck guard Thursday night in the Capitals game against the Islanders. A modest step forward in a sport known for its big hits and toothless smile. Noah Pransky, NBC News. Our thanks to Noah for that reporting. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.